Well, hey, uh, thank you so much, worship team, for getting our hearts ready to jump into God's Word. Uh, so good to see you guys here. All right, how many of y'all, this is your, this is your church time for today. You're, you're done after this. How many of y'all coming back tonight? All right, good deal. All right, fantastic. Love to hear that. It's going to be full. It's going to be wonderful. Uh, five o'clock. What time? Five o'clock. You can get here at six if you want because you're used to that, but it'll be just wrapping up, you know, so don't get here at six. Get here at five. Hey, so um, for the past few years, our neighborhood has done a uh, Christmas light decoration contest, and uh, they post the pictures online, and you get to vote on your favorites. I think we might even have a picture of... Um, of some of that. There we go. Yeah. So here's just some of them. My favorite is the one down here in the corners. We can get a bigger view of that one. Next slide, maybe. There we go. Yeah. Ditto. <laughs> in one short word, he said, he, he communicates what everybody else was doing, you know, with all these lights in their yard and stuff. I, I just absolutely love that. And, and for a while, this guy's sign was in the lead uh, as the top vote getter. I think there were some, uh, some, some late votes or some online voting shenanigans. I don't know what, but uh, I don't think he won, but he came in close. Uh, but in just one simple phrase or one short word, he communicates a lot. Well, that's kind of how John's gospel is. We've been in this series, uh, you know, called uh, God with Us. And John's account of the birth of Jesus, uh, if you've been with us, you've noticed that there's some things missing from the birth of Jesus, the birth story of Jesus in John's account. You know, we haven't talked about uh, Mary and Joseph or the angels or the, uh, the manger or the baby Jesus or the shepherds or, you know, any of that stuff that we normally talk about at Christmas time. Um, and, and by the way, those things uh, we'll get into a little bit later, but what John does is in four simple words, he communicates the same truth that Matthew and Luke uh, took, you know, chapters, a couple of chapters to communicate. In just four short words, some say these are the most important words of the New Testament. Uh, one author says they may be the four most important words in all the Bible. The words are the word became human, or the word became flesh uh, in your translation. And so we celebrate Christ. We celebrate uh, Christ at Christmas because of who he is. He is God. We celebrate Christ at Christmas because of what he offers. He offers the chance uh, for us to become children of God. We celebrate Christ because of what he's already done. He's already done everything needed, everything necessary for you and I uh, to be forgiven of our sins and to be saved by placing our faith in Jesus and his death, burial, and resurrection. And then what we're going to talk about today, we celebrate Christ at Christmas because he came. Because, you know, 2,000 years ago, he came into the world, and those who were anticipating him, those who were expecting him, those who were longing for him, got to say, he is here. And that's what we're celebrating. And here's the thing. You know, tonight, we're going to do all the traditional Christmas stuff. We're going to read the Christmas story, and we'll have the kids come up and, and read a little story for them. And we're going to have some people talk about love and joy and hope and peace, and we'll sing the more familiar songs. But what we're doing this morning and what we've done over the past few weeks really gets us ready to worship tonight, to really celebrate the birth of Christ as we have a better understanding and a better grasp of why we celebrate Christ at Christmas. And so let's jump into this. Um, you know, what, what we celebrate is we celebrate that he is here with us and he came to be God with us. And if you'll let him, he will be God with you today. So let's read. We got John chapter 1, verse 14. We only got one verse today, so we should get out pretty early, right? No. I sent Bridget a picture uh, of me studying for this week, and I said, common sense says, you know, it's Christmas Eve morning, be thankful anybody showed up at all. Me, and I got like a table full of books, you know, me pouring into commentaries, trying to delve the depths of one verse, and she was like, go with simple. All right, so uh, <laughs> John 1, 14 says this, so the word became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. In this passage, John shares how Jesus truly is God with us. 
and, and not only in his birth, but also in his, his life and his ministry and his resurrection. And, and guys, God with us is the greatest gift the world has ever experienced, and it can be the greatest gift you and I experience. So let's unpack this verse. Let's unpack John 1.14 and see why we celebrate that Jesus is here. Number one, if you're following along in your, lo- in your notes, uh, if you pulled them up online on the Bible app, number one is this, God came to live among the people he loved. We celebrate Christ at Christmas because God himself came to live among the people that he loved. He came down to earth in the flesh, in human form, God with us. And back when I was in youth ministry, I might say God in a bod, but I'm not in youth ministry, so I'm not going to say that. Uh, but he came to live among the people he created and the people that he, that he loved. John, listen again, it says, so the word became human and made his home among us, The word became human. Your translation may say the word became flesh. It's the same thing. What it's saying is two things. Jesus is divine. Can you say that with me? Jesus is divine. He is 100% God, fully God, but he is also human. Jesus is divine, but he is also fully divine and fully human. He is the son of God who came to earth in human form. Form. He's not, you know, uh, half God, half man. He's not man who later became God or God who stopped being God and became man that went back to being God. No. At the same time, it, he was totally God and totally man. It's what's known as the doctrine of the incarnation, the divine taking on human form. And that teaching is really at the heart of Christmas. A New Testament professor, D.A. Carson, says this about the incarnation. He says, at the first advent the eternal Son of God, took to himself full humanity. Without ceasing to be God, he became man. He is one uniquely spectacular person with two full and complete natures, perfectly and personally, or perfectly and personally calibrated for us and for our salvation. We celebrate Christ at Christmas because God, as Jesus, came to be with us. Us. Listen again. It says, so the word became human and he made his home among us. Other translations say that he dwelt among us. That word dwelt or the phrase made his home actually translates into he tabernacled among us. Now we don't use that phrase tabernacled much. You know, come to my tabernacle, come tabernacle with me. We just don't do that, do we? But to the Jews who would have heard John's Uh, gospel and would have read his writing, that would have had uh, great significance. They would have recognized that word tabernacle. The tabernacle was a big tent. It was a big tent of meeting from the time of Exodus, and it was the predecessor to the temple that was later built in Jerusalem. The tabernacle was the place where God met with his people. It's the place where God's presence came down among his people. 2,000 years ago, God came to be with humanity. He came down to live among the people he loves. Jesus came to be present with them to fulfill the long-awaited prophecy that one day he truly would be God with us. That's where we see in Matthew chapter 1. It says, uh, verse 20, but after he, talking about uh, Joseph, but after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. And all of this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, talking about Isaiah, the virgin will conceive and give birth to to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. What God offered 2,000 years ago to people living at that time in that region, he still offers today. He still offers his same presence today. The same chance for him to be God with us, God with you, he still offers today. And we celebrate Christ's birth today. We celebrate God with us. But you know, we also celebrate his life because of point number two. Not only did God come uh, to be among the people he loved, number two, we see the reason we celebrate Christ at Christmas is that Jesus was the perfect representation of God to the world. 
Jesus was the absolute perfect representation, the, the, the perfect revelation of God to the world. John MacArthur says that even though the divine was veiled in human flesh, we get glimpses of his divinity. Scripture tells us in Hebrews 1, 3, the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The passage that Pastor Noah read earlier, verse 15, says Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. People say, you know, I would believe in God if I could just see God. You know, I would believe if I could just see him in action, if I could just see, see what he did, hear him talk, you've got it. We got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You've got God in action. You've got the visible image of the God that you say, well, I can't see God. How do I know I can believe in God? You've got it right there. And through Jesus' life, through his ministry, especially through his resurrection, we get to see the glory of God lived out. That's what John's getting at in the second part of verse 14. He says he, talking about Jesus, was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. In this second part of verse, 15, of verse 14, John says two really big things about Jesus. The first thing he says is he was full of love and faithfulness. Unfailing love and faithfulness. Your translation may have a couple of different words. Anybody got them? What is it? Anybody got grace and truth? Yeah? No? Anybody reading along? You're like, okay, cool. You know, are you still with me? Yes, okay. Are you thinking about the Christmas cookies on the back table? By the way, we got about five dozen Christmas cookies on the back table bagged up in bags. Okay, please take them. They will, they, they, we don't need New Year's cookies. All right, please take those with you, somebody. All right, you know, take a bag. Anyways, so he says that Jesus was full of love and faithfulness. Other translations say uh, he was full of grace and truth. The Hebrew term uh, for grace and truth is actually translated into love and faithfulness. Man, if there were ever two attributes that describe God, it is love and faithfulness. You know, God is love. He is what love is. Understanding that, knowing God, uh, that is how we love selflessly and love the way he wants us to. But not only is God love, he is faithful. He is always the same yesterday, today, and forever. And John says that, that Jesus lived those attributes out. Jesus lived those qualities out that he saw, the disciples saw, that he's the perfect representation of God to the people he came to save. The other thing that John says about Jesus is that they saw his glory. They saw God at work in and through him. You know, glory, the reason, we, the reason that we uh, celebrate Christ at Christmas, the reason that we celebrate him is he's the perfect representation of God to man. Uh, you know, glory is something that's worthy of praise, worthy of great praise. You know, you might do good on a job and people say, hey, good job. That's not great praise. That's just like, you know, kudos. That's just thumbs up. But Jesus was worthy of great praise. The Bible says that when he taught, that, that people said, man, he teaches with authority like nobody we've ever seen before. You know, the Bible says that he lived a perfect and sinless life. I was listening to a podcast this morning. There's a guy who tried to live by the Old Testament rules, the Old Testament uh, commands. There's not just the Ten Commandments. Out of those Ten Commandments, there's 613 rules that they came up with based on those Ten Commandments. And the guy tried for a year to live by the Old Testament rules to see if it was possible. And it just is. He just couldn't do it, you know. Jesus, however, lived a sinless life life, all of his life, 33 years, we believe. I can't go 33 minutes without mess, making a mistake, without messing up. Stop laughing over there. Uh, you know, but, <laughs> and sometimes neither can you. And if you think you can, you're like, hmm, well, you know, that you just sinned right there by being judgmental and prideful. So, all right, you get to start over now, okay? But Jesus, Jesus was, uh, was sinless. On top of that, he did miracles. Someone in the area of 40 miracles are recorded in the New Testament where he healed people, cast out demons, uh, cured blindness, cured lameness, even uh, brought people back to life, dead people back to life. Peter, James, and John got to see his glory when he went up on a mountain with them and he was transfigured. And, and then his personal appearance changed into a glorified form. And then Moses and Elijah show up and talk with Jesus about, <clears throat> excuse me, about his approaching uh, death, about his crucifixion. And, and, you know, and the most amazing, most praiseworthy thing about Jesus' life is that he died for our sins and didn't just die. God brought him back to life. He was crucified and then resurrected. 
Guys, that's the gospel. That's what we believe in. That's what we celebrate is Christ crucified and brought back to life. Christ crucified and God raising him back to life. That's what you see all throughout the letters of the New Testament, all throughout Paul's uh, teaching is, is that message right there. It's not just about living a better life, although you should if you're a believer. It's not just about trying harder, although you should if you're a Christ follower. What we believe in, what we celebrate is Christ crucified and resurrected. Amen? That's what it's all about. And that's why Jesus is praiseworthy. And I tell you all this, and and some of you are like, listen, you know, we've heard that. We know. We get it. You can move on. I mean, we're the ones who showed up Christmas Eve morning. Come on, you know. I mean, we're the faithful. But, But I tell you that because that's what matters. That's what more than anything else that we can talk about, we're going to talk about Jesus. More than anything else we can celebrate, we're going to celebrate Jesus. And yes, we're going to celebrate the baby Jesus, but we're going to celebrate the resurrected Jesus because that's what gives us life is believing in him, believing in who he is and what he did. And guys, it matters. It matters what you believe in. It matters what you believe in. It's not enough just to be a good person. It's not enough just to live a more moral life. It's not enough just to be a good provider for your family or to be a good husband or a good wife or an obedient kid or or whatever, you know. It's not enough just to have a faith in something. It matters where you place your faith. And what we see is that Jesus shows that he's worth believing in. He's the real deal. Jesus is who points us to God, shows us the way that we can be in relationship with God, shows us that he is the only way to God. And so we worship Jesus at Christmas. We celebrate Christ at Christmas because, yes, he's God who came to be among the people who he loved and because Jesus is the perfect representation of God to us. And guys, if we're honest, if we're honest, you know, Jesus being the way to God, that's what we've always wanted. Number three is this, God with us is our deepest longing. God with us is our deepest longing. Jesus came to be God with us, and if we're really honest, if we're really honest, we really think about it, that's what we want more than anything, is God with us. Now, we may say, well, I want, I want a better job, or I want more financial security, or, you know, man, I really wish, you know, this health issue could get dealt with, or, you know, this, this you know, I really want the, you know, to know that things are going to turn out okay for me, or for my kids, or even my grandkids, or, you know, You know, we say we want all sorts of things. If only this would happen, if only that would happen. But what we want more than anything, whether we realize it, what we want more than anything is to know that God is with us. That's what we want more than anything. The Bible says that God was with Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 3. He was walking with them and talking with them. They got to enjoy his presence uh, in the garden. Revelation tells us, you know, that's how everything started off. Revelation tells us in chapter 21 that one day, one day, we're going to get to be with God forever and ever and ever, and there will be no more sorrow or sickness or crying or any of those things. We're going to get to enjoy being in his presence. Moses said to God in Exodus chapter 33, he said, look, if you're not going with me, I don't want to go forward. I don't want to take a step without you. And then later on, he assures Joshua in in Deuteronomy 31. He says, don't worry about anything you're going to face because God will be with you. Psalm 107 talks about people uh, crying out to God in their distress. Why? Because they need God to rescue them. When we need God to be with us, to rescue us. And for hundreds of years, God's people longed for and looked for a Savior, a Messiah, a Deliverer to come rescue them. And in the birth story of the Messiah, we see people like Simeon and Anna at the temple who had prayed for years hoping to see God with us and they finally got to see him. Even in our current culture, in the language that we use, we want God with us us. Have you ever said goodbye to someone? Of course you have. That word goodbye is actually a shortened, for, a shortened form of the phrase, God be with you. So even in our, uh, our subconscious culture, what we're saying to people when we wish them well is we're saying, listen, I wish you well. I wish that God would be with you because that's the most well thing that can happen to you. And it's not just in English. It happens in Spanish. I know you came today looking for a Spanish lesson from this right here, but hang with me. If you've ever said adios to somebody, it means goodbye, right? It doesn't just mean goodbye. It's actually a shortened form of of to God, or rather, I commend you to God or commit you to God. 
God. A, a bigger version of it is via condios, which means go with God. But if you ever say adios, you're saying to God or I commit you to God. So it's universal. It's in both languages. What we want, whether we realize it or not, what we want more than anything is God with us and God with you and with you and with you and with you because that's the absolute best thing ever. It's ingrained in us. It's ingrained in our culture to want God with us, even if we don't acknowledge that it's God we want. Like I said, we may want assurance that things are going to be okay or that the struggles we go through won't last or that help from somewhere is on the way. And what we're saying is, you know, I really need some hope. I really need some peace. I really need something to, to give me joy. I really need assurance. I really need security. I really need rest. And what we want is what only God can offer. What we need is God with us. And so that's why we celebrate that Jesus is here, is because he is God with us. 2,000 years ago, he fulfilled the promise to become God with us. And today, he can be God with us, God with you, if you'll let him. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, all across the room, I pray that your spirit continues to move. As we get ready to worship you, as our worship team comes and gets ready to lead us in, in a time of response, God, I pray that there would be a total surrender of our hearts to you right now. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would respond to the prayers and the songs and the scripture and the sermon. And God, that we would say, I am ready for you to be God with me today. However that is that needs to happen in your life, that's my prayer for you today. In Christ's name we pray. Everybody said, amen. Amen. Hey, let me just give you a couple.